Well, I'm certainly glad that you've decided to take advantage of the lessons that we have posted online during this time in which we are facing the COVID-19 crisis in our country. It's always difficult when we make the decision not to assemble together, and hopefully this will be short-lived and we'll be back to our normal assemblies soon. But in the meantime, we need to do the very best that we can to study the Word of God on our own and to take advantage of opportunities to study the Word of God collectively through the means that we have available to us. This morning, I want to talk to you for just a little bit about the gospel in five seconds. When you think about the gospel in five seconds, I don't know where that idea originally originated from. I heard a preacher years ago preach a lesson with these five points, and it helps us really to remember some of the very basics of the gospel of Jesus Christ if we can remember just five seconds. Let's begin by defining our terms before we talk about the five seconds that sort of summarize the gospel. The first word we need to define is understanding exactly what is meant by the word gospel. We know about the gospel. The word gospel simply means good message or glad tidings. It is a compound word in the Greek language for message and then the word for good. We talk about a form of the word evangelist, which is a bringer of good tidings. And certainly the gospel is the greatest of all messages. It is the message of salvation, the message of Christ coming to this world and dying for our sins. And there is no better gospel message or message than the message presented in the gospel of Jesus Christ. He said it's good news because it is the message of salvation. Paul said in Romans 1 and verse 16 that I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. In summarizing the gospel in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, in verses 1 through verse 4, Paul said, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel, which I preach to you, which you also receive, in which ye stand, by which you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he's buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. And so the gospel is the message we're saved by, and it contains the message about the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so when we talk about the gospel, we're talking about the good news of salvation presented in the New Testament. When we talk about the word second, we talk about the gospel in five seconds, the word second can have a variety of meaning. It could mean a short period of time, but we're not talking about the gospel in just five seconds little seconds. I've never spoken that short before in my life, and there's not a lot that can be said in simply five seconds. Sometimes we use the word second to mean something that's inferior. It is seconds in terms of its quality, and that's not the means in which we're using the word here this morning. We're talking about it in the sense of order in line or in time, something that is second. You have something first in chronology, and something that follows after that would be second. And that's the sense in which we're using the word seconds here in our study this morning. So we think about the gospel in five seconds. One of the very first things we have to remember and can use in teaching our friends is that the gospel is indeed the second covenant that God made with mankind. The Bible speaks, of course, in the Old Testament, of the Old Testament, as being the first covenant. There is no doubt to the sincere Bible believer that there is more than one covenant. The concept that some have advocated that we're under one eternal covenant simply doesn't fit with what the Bible teaches us about the Old and the New Testament. The Bible very clearly tells us, for example, in passages like Hebrews chapter 8 and verses 6 and verse 7, that there was a first covenant and a second covenant. Describing the first, he said in Hebrews 8, 6, and 7, But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry, and as much as he's also the mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no place sought for a second. And so that very clearly there is a first covenant and there is a second covenant. In verse 13, in that he says a new covenant, he's made the first obsolete. Now what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. And so there's a first covenant and there's a second covenant. There is an Old Covenant, and there is a New Covenant. When we talk about the Old Testament, we're talking about that first covenant that God made with mankind. 
The need for another covenant, I think, is very clearly seen in the fact that there was no forgiveness under that first covenant. In the book of Hebrews chapter 10 and 1 through 4, the Hebrew writer argues certainly at great length that it, that the, all the sacrifices that were offered under that old covenant did not do anything to take care of the problem of sin. In Hebrews chapter 10 and 1 to 4, the Hebrew writer said, If the law, having a shadow of the good things to come and not the very image of the things, can never, with these same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year, make those that, are, that approach perfect, for then would they not have ceased to be offered. For the worshippers once purged would have no more consciousness of sins. But in those sacrifices there is a reminder of sins every year, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sin. And so that first covenant couldn't offer forgiveness. That first covenant was a covenant that was intended only for the Jews. It didn't include you and I as Gentiles. In fact, verse 11 said, none of them shall teach his neighbor and none his brothers, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them. That's a, a contrast between the old and the new. But the contrast is that under the old covenant, you were born into that covenant. As a Jew, you were part of God's covenant people. But in the New Testament, it's going to be a matter of choice as whether you become part of the people of God or not. And the first was simply a figure of what was to come. In Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 24 he said that Christ entered the holy places not made with hands, which are copies of the things in heaven. Which are copies, he said, but the heavenly things had to be uh, uh, had to be sanctified with better things than these. And so Christ didn't enter the, the holy place made with hands, but that which is copies or figures of the true. Uh, much of what God gave in the Old Testament prefigured what was coming in Christ Jesus. And so when we think about the Old Testament, it's the first covenant. But the gospel is the second covenant. For there to be a second covenant, the first covenant had to be taken away. He's taken out of the way the handwriting of requirements that was against us, that was contrary to us. He's taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. I, one of the most important fundamental facts that we ever learn as children of God, as Bible students, is the fact that that old covenant's been taken away. So many times we see religious friends and neighbors that want to go back to the Old Covenant and talk about principles underneath that Old Covenant as if they are still applicable today. We talk about tithing. We talk about instrumental music. We talk about, um, we, we talk about the Sabbath day. That is, people in the religious world use that terminology, not realizing that the law that spoke about those things was taken out of the way and it was nailed to the cross. And so that law is no longer in force. We don't live under that law anymore. But now we live under the second law. It was in force because it went in force when the one that gave it died. The Hebrew writer in Hebrews chapter 9, 15 to 17, used the illustration of a testament or a will. And he points out that when a testament, when, when a testator is living, or when a will giver is living, that will can be changed, it can be modified. It's not into effect. If your parents write you into their will, you cannot go say, I want what's coming to me right now. That will is not ratified. It's not going to effect until their death. In a very similar way, the covenant of Jesus Christ did not go into effect until he died. And when he died, the Hebrew writer points out that now that first covenant has been taken away and now we live under that second covenant. It was a different illustration given in Romans chapter 7, 1 to 4, when the Hebrew writer uses the marriage illustration. And the point that the, that the Roman writer, the Apostle Paul, uses in that point is, is that a, a man and a woman are bound by the law together forever, as long as the both of them live. He's not discussing the exception in Romans chapter 7, just the basic principle that marriage is a lifelong commitment. And then he points out, however, that if a woman dies, or if a man dies, excuse me, and a woman remarries, we don't consider her to be an adulterer because we realize that that death freed her from her husband so that she's free to be married to another. And the Apostle Paul goes on to argue in Romans 7 in a very similar way. When Christ died on the cross, that put to death the law. And now that that old covenant has been put to death, we are now free to be bound to another that is to Christ. And so the gospel is the second covenant. And it is the covenant that is enforced today. And so when it comes to our authority, when it comes to our practices, we don't go back to the Old Testament. 
Whether we go to the New Testament, that is the testament that is in force at this point in time. And unlike the old law, it is a perfect law. It is the perfect law of liberty, James chapter 1 and verse 25. It is perfect in that it will be God's permanent law. It's not designed to be replaced. It's perfect in that it provides freedom and liberty from sin. In Hebrews chapter 9 and in verse 12, the Hebrew writer says, it offers eternal redemption under this new covenant. Because not with the blood of bulls and goats did Jesus enter the most holy place, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place of all, having obtained eternal redemption. In fact, the Hebrew writer argues many in many uh, passages in his epistle that the sacrifice of Christ was not like the Old Testament sacrifices. They were always offered. And at any point in time, had they been successful, in taking care of what they were uh, taking care of the problem of sin, they would have ceased to be offered. But the fact that they were continually offered suggests that they were inferior, that they were inadequate to take care of the problem of sin. Jesus, on the other hand, offered himself once for all. And what that means is that he didn't have to offer another sacrifice. It took care of the problem of sin, and it took care of that problem forever. And so we have a covenant that the Hebrew writer said in Hebrews chapter 7, 18 and 19 is a better covenant established on better hope, and through that covenant we can draw near to God. So when we think about the gospel, one of the very first things we need to think about is that it's God's second covenant. The first has been taken out of the way. We don't live under that law. We do not go back to that law, and we certainly do not try to establish our practices by that law. Why would we want to? When it was a law that kept us in sin, when it was a law that was inferior, a law that was weak in terms of offering forgiveness, why would we go back to that when we have a law that offers eternal redemption that brings us a better hope through which we may draw near unto God? But not only is it vitally important that we understand that the gospel is a second covenant, it's also important that we understand that the gospel demands a second birth. Of course, a second birth implies a first birth. And the first birth is the birth by which we came into this world. Everybody that's uh, listening here uh, this morning it was born physically into this world. We have a birthday that we celebrate. That's our first birth. That first birth does not entitle us, of course, to any spiritual provisions as we grow older. And that's why when we have reached a point of accountability and we've sinned and transgressed God's law, that we need to be born again. That second birth, of course, is talked about in the book of John, chapter 3, in verses 1 through verse 8. You and I are all familiar with the conversation that Jesus had with Nicodemus in the third chapter of the book of John. Nicodemus, of course, was a believer in the Lord, but he tried to keep that secret. Um, much like Joseph Arimathea, and the, the desire to keep it secret is seen in the fact that he came to Jesus by night. And he asked Jesus, what can I do that... Uh, uh, that I, or, or excuse me, let me back up. He said, you're a teacher come from God, for no one can do these things unless God is with him. And Jesus just immediately told him, most assuredly I say unto you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. That confused Nicodemus. To you and I, the language of the second birth is very familiar. But for Nicodemus, it sort of caught him off guard. And he wondered, how is it that a man can be born a second time? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus made it very clear. I'm not talking about a physical birth. But most assuredly, I say unto you, unless one is born of the water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said unto you, you must be born again. And so Jesus is saying, I'm not talking about a physical birth. I'm not talking about entering a second time into your mother's womb, but rather I am talking about a birth that is spiritual in nature. It is a birth of the water and of the spirit. We think about that second birth or being begotten again. We are born again of the incorruptible seed. That is, it is obedience to the gospel that brings about the second birth. That's what Jesus meant when he said we're born of the Spirit, is that it's born in accordance with the Word of God. That's why Peter in 1 Peter chapter 1, 22 and 23 says, Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth, through the Spirit and sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, through the Word of God, which lives and abides forever. 
forever. And so it is that being born of the, of the Word of God. Well, what does the Word of God teach us one has to do? Well, it's interesting that later on in the same epistle in 1 Peter 3 and verse 21, the Apostle Peter said there is a like figure that also saves us, namely baptism. Not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience uh, toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so being born of the water and the Spirit is being born of the Word of God by being buried in the waters of baptism. In James and James chapter 1 and in verse 18, talking about our being born again or our having been begotten again, says that we are begotten by the word of truth. Of his own will he brought us forth or begot us through the word of truth that we might be the kind of first fruits of his creatures. We are begotten through the gospel. First Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 15. Paul said you might have many instructors in Christ, yet you do not have many fathers for in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. All of those passages really are saying essentially the same thing, and that is that there is a first birth, but there is another begetting that has to take place. And if that second begetting is not physical, but it's spiritual, and it's through our obedience to the gospel of Jesus Christ, that that birth takes place. Uh, to put it another way, it's only after that new birth that we have new life. In the book of Galatians 3, 26 and 27, says you're all sons of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. It's what Paul did in Acts 22, 16, when he's told, Arise and be baptized and wash away his sins, calling on the name of the Lord. And so the, the gospel is a second covenant. But it is a second covenant that demands a second birth after our first birth That is being born of the water and the spirit are being begotten by the word of God, by obedience to that word, and being buried in the waters of baptism. But why is it that we should be concerned about being born again? The answer is because the gospel is designed to prepare us for the second coming. It is a second covenant that demands a second birth in order to prepare for the second coming of Jesus Christ. Of course, when we think about the second coming, that implies a first coming, and that is his birth into this world. In Matthew chapter 2, we read about Jesus having come into this world. You remember in uh, Joseph and Mary had found themselves in Bethlehem because they had to declare for the uh, the tax. But it said in Matthew 2 and verse 1 that after this, Jesus was born in Bethlehem. And that's his first entrance into this world, uh, the incarnation as he comes in the form of that babe in that manger in Bethlehem. That first coming was a great sacrifice. It took humility. He emptied himself, and he came to this earth, according to Paul in Philippians chapter 2, verses 7, verse 8, in obedience to the Father. And for that reason, God has exalted him and given him the name that is above every other name. And we certainly uh, like to talk about that birth. A lot of times the world likes to think about that birth of our Lord and how he came into this world, and and everything surrounding his birth. And it's a, certainly a wonderful story about the birth of our Lord. But as concerned as we are about his first coming, we need to be concerned about the fact that he is going to come again. And when he comes again, it's not going to be for the same reason that he came the first time. The first time he came to save man from his sins. The first time he came that he might offer himself as a sacrifice so that you and I could be saved. But when he returns a second time, it is going to be for judgment. And that's why you and I need to be concerned about what the covenant that he put that went into effect at his death says and demands of you and I. Let me just say that Jesus promised to come again. In John 14 and verse 3, Jesus said, If I go away, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. That's why in the the book of Acts chapter 1, when the disciples were looking so longingly into heaven as the Lord ascended, the angels that were standing nearby just simply said to them, Why are you stand gazing? The same Jesus that you saw ascend will so come in like manner as you saw him ascend unto heaven. Uh, The Apostle Paul talked about that coming more than once in the book of 1 and 2 Thessalonians. In fact, the first epistle to the Thessalonians ends, every chapter ends with a reference to the second coming of Christ because that needed to be fresh in the minds of these new converts uh, 
if they were going to succeed and be as faithful as they needed to be to the Lord. It does seem they misunderstood some of what Paul might have said about that second coming. And the second epistle was written to uh, clarify some of that. But in, in talking about that coming, Paul made it clear in chapter 1 of the second epistle, verse 7, that Jesus was going to come and give you that are troubled rest when Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. And so Jesus is going to come, and when he comes, he's going to come back with all of his mighty angels. Verse 10 says, When he comes in that day to be glorified in his saints, to be admired among all those that believe, because our testimony among you was believed. So when he comes, it's going to be a time of glorification of the saints. It's going to be a time where he's going to be admired among all those that have believed in him. And so it's going to be a wonderful day when he returns if we've been on the side of having served him. But Hebrews chapter 9 in verse 28 makes it clear that at that point in time, it's not going to be a returning where an opportunity to be saved is going to be offered. In verse 28, he said, Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin unto salvation. The English Standard Version says not to deal with sin. He's not going to have to do that. He did that the first time he came. But he's going to come to save those that are eagerly waiting for him. I learned in that verse not only that when Jesus comes, he's not going to come to deal with sin because he's dealt with it already, but I also learned that the second coming is not a thing that as Christians we should uh, dread. It is not something that we that the very thought of should cause fear to, uh, to enter into our hearts, but rather it should be something that we're eagerly anticipating and eagerly waiting for. The time in which he's going to return is unknown. There are a lot of things that we wish we knew in life. I've said more than once this week as we think about this uh, crisis that's facing our country that I wish I knew exactly when it it was all going to be over. Uh, Is it going to be over this week? Is it going to be over next week? Is it going to be a month? All that would certainly help us to make decisions with regard to how we respond to the current crisis. Uh, And it would be nice to know, certainly, when the Lord was going to return. But the Bible doesn't provide that information for us, and there's no way for us to know when he's going to come. In fact, 2 Peter chapter 3 and 1 to 9 makes it very clear that when he comes, he's going to come as a thief in the night. Just like a thief does not announce his coming, neither is the Lord going to announce when he is going to return. In fact, Jesus would say in Matthew chapter 24, of that day and of that hour, no one knows. Only the Father in heaven. In fact, at the time that Jesus made that uh, speech in Matthew chapter 24 to his disciples about the destruction of Jerusalem, he said even the Son did not know when he was going to come. And because we don't know the time of his coming, we've got to be ready at all times. We've got to be ready so that when he does come, we'll not be like the five foolish virgins in Matthew chapter 25 and be caught unprepared, but rather we'll have enough oil that we are ready for his, his return. Now, when he comes again, there are a number of things that are going to take place. First of all, it's going to be judgment. All nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides the sheep from his goats. In other words, you're going to be there, and I'm going to be there. And in that day, the books are going to be open. That's why I'm concerned about what the second covenant says and why I need to be concerned about being born again because there's coming a time in which the Lord's going to come back And then I'm going to stand before him and I'm going to have to give an account for how I have lived and what I have done and whether or not I have obeyed the gospel that he has revealed in the New New Testament. Let me say, not only do we have to be concerned about what's going to happen because of judgment, but it's also going to be destruction. It's going to mean the end of this world. In the book of 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 4, 10, 12, 13, all those verses talks about how the the creation has continued as it was since the very beginning of time. God has never completely wiped everything out. He did wipe out the living things um, uh, in the the giving of the flood or the sin of the flood. And so when somebody says all things have continued as they are, they're ignorant of that fact. But this world has continued from the very beginning of time. But there's going to come a time in which the elements will melt with fervent heat and the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. As much as we think about uh, need to take care of this world that we live in and care for the planet in which we reside, the reality is when God gets ready to destroy it, there's nothing mankind can do to save that. God has appointed a time in which he is going to destroy this world and everything in it. And so it's going to be a time of judgment. It's going to be a time of destruction. And it's going to be a time of reward for the faithful. 
Again, we go back to that passage, Hebrews 9.28. It should be a passage of great comfort to us. He will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. The Bible uses the term salvation in more than one way. Sometimes it refers to our current salvation. Um, that is that we are in a saved relationship with the Lord right now. And we certainly need to cherish that. But oftentimes the Bible uses the word salvation to refer to our eternal salvation in the judgment day. Um, and using it in that way in the book of 1 Peter, talks about, uh, Peter talks about having received the end of your faith, the salvation of your soul. That is, when this world is over and we stand before God in the day of judgment, we receive what was the end result of our faith, and that is being saved, having that home in heaven. It's interesting that in Revelation chapter 20, the very end of that chapter, presents the, the judgment scene where we are judged by God, by the things that are contained in the books. That's where the books are opened and the dead, small and great, stand before God. And then the very next chapters describe that wonderful home in heaven. That is the that is the bride prepared for husband. That is the church and the faithful in their eternal glorious state, having received the salvation that is offered through Christ Jesus. And so the second coming is the reason we need to be concerned about what that second covenant says. It's the reason we need to be born again or be concerned about that second birth because there is a second coming. And in that time, there's going to be a judgment that is going to take place. Now, the reason I need to be concerned about that second coming is because the gospel is designed to help us to avoid the second death. Perhaps there would not be as much of a motivation to obey the gospel if you either received heaven or there was nothing. Now, certainly heaven by itself is motivation enough in order to serve the Lord. But the reality is there is another alternative, and that is the second death. The first death is certainly something that we all face. The first death is our physical death. It is appointed unto man once to die, and after that, the judgment. It is an unavoidable appointment. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 7 says that the body will turn to the dust from which it came, and the spirit will turn to God that gave it. Death, the physical death, is our separation of our body from our spirit. There's really nothing that you and I can do to avoid that death. We can take care of ourselves. Um, we can uh, try to avoid getting sick. But, you know, the reality is, at the end of the day, we're all going to die. Unless the Lord returns, death is an appointment that all men keep. Yet there is a death that is avoidable. Not the first death, but you and I can avoid the second death. That second death is that eternal separation from God in a place that the Bible calls hell. That's why you and I need to be concerned about the second coming of Christ, because you and I are going to receive one of two sentences. We will either receive the sentence of life or the sentence of death. God will either say to us, welcome, well done, good and faithful servant, or he will say, depart from me, you that practice lawlessness. In the book of Revelation chapter 20, Verses 14 and 15, the Bible says, Then death and Hades were cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And so there's a place of a lake of fire that the Bible describes as the place of the second death. Uh, the, the Apostle John also mentioned that in Revelation chapter 21 and 7 and 8, where he is contrasting the reward of the faithful with the destiny of the wicked. And what he said in verse 7 of Revelation 21 is he overcome shall inherit all things and I will be his God and he shall be my son. But, and here's the contrast, the cowardly, the unbelieving, the abominable, the murderers, the sexually immoral, uh, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. I, I can't imagine in my, in my worst dreams what that place must be like a place of fire, a place of, of brimstone or a sulfur-like substance. Uh, obviously, these are figurative descriptions of what hell is going to be like, but the description is such that certainly you and I would look at that and say, there is absolutely no way that I would want to go there. No way that I would want to spend an eternity in a place that is described as second death. Nobody really likes death, the concept of death at all. But being a place of eternal death certainly should strike fear in all of our, all of our hearts. Uh, when we think about that second death, it's called death because it is, among other things, eternal separation from God. Do you remember that in the book of 2 Thessalonians 1, we read a few moments ago about the Lord's return 
He'll give those that are troubled rest, and he's going to be glorified in his saints. But in between those verses where he talks about the great news for the saints, there is terrible news for those that haven't obeyed the gospel. That is, the Lord is going to come in flaming fire and take vengeance on those that know not God and obey not the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of God and from the glory of his might. The idea of being punished from the presence of God, that is an eternal separation from God. You know, we have all been separated from God at some point in time. That's what sin does to us. But as long as we're here on this law, in this world, as long as we have life and breath in us, we have the opportunity to remedy that situation. And that's what the concept of reconciliation is all about. We were separated, but now we've been reconciled back to God. You see, in the second death, it's an eternal separation. And what that means is there's no chance of reconciliation. There's no chance of that relationship ever being, ever being uh, put back together. In Luke chapter 16 and 19 to 21, you have on one side in the Edean realm, Lazarus, who is in Abraham's bosom. And you have on the other side, the rich man. And in describing his eternal punishment, he said that there was a great gulf or a great chasm which no man can pass. That is, there is that separation that is, can never be fixed. There is that gulf that can never be passed. It is an eternal separation from God. That, again, ought to be something that scares every one of us. Uh, and, and scares us not in the sense that we live in fear, but scares us in the sense that it motivates us to want to do something that we might avoid that punishment. It's worse than being stoned. In the book of Hebrews chapter 10, the Hebrew writer said that those that died under the old law died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses of how much worse punishment we suppose he be thought worthy, who trampled underfoot the Son of God and counted the blood of the cut and she sanctified a common thing and insulted the Spirit of grace. Um, can you imagine being stoned to death? Uh, I can't imagine what that would be like. If I had a, a, an ability to choose how I'm going to die, I am pretty sure that being stoned to death is not going to make my top ten list of ways that I would choose to end my life here on this earth. Uh, and yet, the Hebrew writer is trying to get the, his readers to understand how bad it is to not serve the Lord. How bad it is to be found dis, displeasing God by having rejected the word of his son. And he's saying it's worse than being stoned to death without mercy. And it's worse than, than being stoned because it's everlasting. You know, a stoning takes place only for a period of time and then it's gone. Your life is ended, but the pain does not of, of a stoning does not last forever. But we're talking about everlasting death. These should be punished with everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. It is a place of torment, Revelation chapter 14 and verse 11 uh, tells us. Uh, the smoke of their torment will ascend forever and ever. And so the gospel is a second covenant given by man to replace a covenant that was never intended to be permanent, and never intended to provide man forgiveness of sins, but God gave that second covenant that you and I might be saved. That second covenant demands a second birth, being born of the water and the Spirit, that we might be ready for the second coming, that we might avoid the second death prepared for the disobedient. But there is good news in the gospel of Christ. That is, not only is there the second birth, but if we've sinned after we've obeyed the gospel, God has provided a second law of pardon. Certainly, all of us should strive to live lives that are pleasing and acceptable to God after obedience to the gospel. We strive not to sin, 1 John chapter 2 and verse 1. We should never minimize sin. We should never look at things and just say, oh, well, we all sin, and that's just part of our daily lives. No, as Christians, the Bible says, try not to do that. In fact, the child of God does not sin, 1 John 3, 4. That doesn't mean he never stumbles, but it means he doesn't make a practice of that in his life. But there is good news. The great news for you and I is that even though we have sinned after our obedience to the gospel, God has provided a second law of pardon. I don't know of a particular passage that uses that phrase, the second law of pardon. But we used to describe it because the first law of pardon is the law for the alien sinner. That is, before we've obeyed the gospel, when we're, when we're alien sinners, and by alien sinners we just simply mean those that are not Christians, they've never obeyed the gospel, they've never enjoyed that relationship with God, God has provided a law of pardon for them. And the law of pardon is that second birth. Acts 2.38, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. In the book of Acts chapter 8, Acts the 8th chapter and 26 through 40, we have an Ethiopian eunuch, a noble man, 
under Queen Candace that had gone to Jerusalem for worship. And Philip was called away to teach him. And when he taught him what he needed to do, he taught him the necessity of being baptized. In fact, I know that because as they were going along and Philip was preaching Jesus, the Ethiopian eunuch said, See, here's water. What did hinder me from being baptized? And they stopped the chariot. And Philip and the eunuch got out and he baptized him. That's the law of pardon for the alien sinner. That's what the Ethiopian eunuch had to do to be saved. That's what the people on the day of Pentecost had to do to be saved. It's what Saul of Tarsus did in Acts chapter 22 and verse 16. He was not a Christian. He was a religious man. But there's a difference in being a religious person and being a Christian. He was not following the Lord. He was not obeying the gospel. And so when he came and uh, or when Ananias came to him, and told him what he had to do. He said, Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. But what if we've sinned after we've done that? We don't have to be baptized again every time we sin. We don't Every time we have transgressed God's law after our obedience to the gospel, we don't run again to the waters of baptism. And the reason for that is God has provided a second law of pardon for those that are his children, a means whereby we can be forgiven after obedience to the gospel. It is that law of pardon that we read about in Acts chapter 8 and verse 13. Simon the sorcerer is an interesting character. In verse 13, he had followed that first law of pardon. And the Bible says, Simon himself also believed and he was baptized. He continued with Philip and was amazed seeing the miracles and the signs which were done. But it wasn't long after Simon obeyed the gospel that he made the mistake of trying to buy the gift of God with money. In doing so, his priorities were in the wrong place. In doing so, he had been guilty of bitterness. He had been guilty of sin. And so Simon was reproved by the Apostle Peter. And he was told what he needed to do to get things right. What Peter didn't tell him to do was to go back to the waters of baptism. Why? Because he'd already done that. Instead, what Peter told Simon that he needed to do was to repent of this thy wickedness and pray to God that perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. The law of pardon for Simon was different than it was when he was an alien sinner. This law demanded that he acknowledge his sin, that he repent, that is that he decide he's going to turn around and quit doing the things he'd been doing that were wrong, and then ask God to forgive him. Simon possessed an attitude of repentance, it seems, in Acts chapter 8, because he turned to Peter and he said, Pray for me that none of these things may come upon me. That's very similar to what John was writing about in 1 John chapter 1 in verses 8 and verse 9. He's writing to Christians. He's writing to people who have been cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. And what he said in verse 8 is this, If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with the Father. Uh, we have fellowship, he said, uh, excuse me, I'm not in verse 8. I'm back in verse 6. If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ his Son cleanses us from all sin. That is, if we're trying to do the right thing, trying to walk in the light, the blood of Christ provides forgiveness after our initial obedience to the gospel. But it's not unconditional forgiveness. It is not forgiveness without condition. In fact, verses 8 and verse 9 says, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So the law is you confess it, you acknowledge it, and you seek the forgiveness that comes from God. That's why James in James chapter one, uh, James chapter five and nineteen twenty would say, "Confess your trespasses one to another, and pray one for another, that you might be healed." That is, when we sin, we confess those as public as they happen to be, and we ask God to forgive us. If it's a private sin, we we seek forgiveness privately. If it's something that's more publicly known, it may require us to acknowledge that to others to pray for us. It may involve just those that have been directly involved by the sin. Or if it's something that's very publicly known, it may require public acknowledgement. But the forgiveness is based upon our confession, our acknowledgement, and our repentance. Don't ever lose sight of the fact that repentance is always necessary. One can acknowledge something and not repent. But repentance means we're going to turn around and we're going to try to do better. We're going to leave that behind. Godly sorrow leads, of course, to repentance. And the great news is, is that when we do that, God's ready to accept. And the story of the prodigal son, one of the most heartwarming stories to be found in all the word of God, that son just came to himself and decided to go back to the father. And when he came back, the father saw him afar off and he ran and he fell on his neck and he restored him back not to a servant, not as a uh, inferior person in the household, 
but he restored him back to the full benefits of sonship. In fact, the Bible said he had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Of course, in that story, that prodigal son is the sinner and the father is God. And it represents the fact that when we come back to God, God is ready to forgive. Aren't you grateful for that second law of pardon? We all have to use it from time to time. And we certainly are grateful for that, that we might be ready when the Lord comes back as well. See, if we can just sort of remember the the five seconds of the gospel. Uh, It's a very simple thing that didn't originate with me. But it does help us to remember five important facts about the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's God's second covenant. The first was obsolete. It's been taken out of the way. We live under the new covenant. It demands that we be born again of the water and the spirit, the second birth that we might be ready for the second coming of Christ when he comes to judge this world and reward the faithful, that you and I might avoid the second death. And also in conjunction with avoiding that second death, God has provided the second law of pardon that we might be forgiven after obedience to the gospel. I hope that this study can be valuable to you, and I certainly hope that we'll be back to our normal practices very, uh, very soon. And I do want to emphasize again the importance that in this time of crisis, first of all, praying, praying for our country that this will pass soon, praying for our congregation and particularly for our elderly and for the uh, compromised health-wise that they'll avoid uh, this, what can be a very dangerous virus for those in those particular categories. Pray for our spiritual strength, that we will continue to grow spiritually, that we will continue to help one another as best we can through this difficult time. Thank you very much for your kind attention.